night, guys. Well, it cannot make up its mind whether it is a gray, gloomy, or a little bit sunny late summer day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization where somehow we have made it to, uh, what have we made it to? Thursday, September 9th. 2021 somewhere around there and the little dog and I are hanging outside the rat infested tiny house the rats have moved in and before we head off to go to war with rats I'm gonna do what I'm gonna try to remember to do each Thursday and uh, this is to visit what I have rediscovered recently as in many ways, the single most honest, straightforward chronicler of the collapse uh, as anybody out there. And surprisingly enough, coming from oilprice.com, which is, uh, which I, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's one of the most schizophrenic uh, newsletters I, I've ever found and you can go on to oilprice.com and read all these stories yourself or you can sign up to get their newsletter y you know it's catered towards fossil fuel investors but uh, for whatever reason they are all over the board uh, I would be more confused than ever if I was thinking about uh, investing in fossil fuels, uh, depending on which article you're reading, but for whatever reason the, the editors and publishers are doing this, half the articles tell you about how uh, to invest in them, and the other, the other half sounds like that fossil fuels are just going down the toilet, the price of So anyway, I wouldn't know what to do, but since I'm not a fossil fuel investor, I'm just a chronicler of the collapse. So each Thursday, I'm going just to pick out a handful of stories from oilprice.com. So, uh, oh yes, before we dive in, I want to send out a big thank you to Dr. Jim, to Dr. Jim for his very kind uh, <clears throat> donation to my Patreon page, and anybody who wants to join the lonely club of the Collapse Chronicles Patreon page, you'll find how to do that in the introduction to each one of these videos. All right, it sounds like we have some uh, planet eating going on. We're finally getting, we're almost to the top of the stairwell to nowhere where we're using a couple of tons of concrete to make our stairwell to nowhere. But anyway, <clears throat> we're going to kick off. This one is right here in Yahoo News today uh, from oilprice.com. Glad to see oilprice.com showing up in Yahoo News. Straight into the point, soaring gasoline prices could cripple Biden's energy agenda. President Joe Biden's prioritization of the shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy has drawn a lot of attention since his first days in office when he killed the Keystone XL pipeline. Not all of this attention has been flattering, with the oil and gas industry quick to voice its concerns about the course the White, the White House is taking in energy, and then Biden asked OPEC for more oil. The now notorious call by the U.S. president on the world's largest oil producer this summer was actually his second one since taking office. In both cases, the reason was to keep prices at the pump low enough to keep people content, which the Houston Chronicle's Chris Tomlinson said in a recent column is akin to running on ice. 
quoting uh, columnist uh, Chris Tomlinson, quote, anyone who says we can switch to clean energy without raising the price for fossil fuels is a fraud or, in this case, a politician. Yes, Tomlinson wrote, noting one of the many, but s many simple, but often painful truths that politicians in power often face. You can make all the green energy promises in the world, but if you let the price of gasoline rise be beyond a certain level, you start losing voters. And for a politician, this is much worse than carbon emissions. Yuppers. How many times have I said the number one issue on an American consumer's mind is the price of gasoline? Number one, <clears throat> the link between gasoline prices and a president's chance for re-election or his party's success in next year's midterms becomes even more important than usual during times of economic turmoil. And although the U.S. economy has been booming this year, <clears throat> a slowdown has already begun, inflation worries are running high, and a shortage of everything continues to plague virtually all industries. <clears throat> What the Crons Tomlinson calls, quote, antipodal energy policy is an interesting conundrum. <clears throat> Trying to reconcile the interest of the environmentalist lobby while keeping regular Americans calm, calm, with low gasoline prices. It is also a conundrum that has no solution. One or more parties will lose because this is an either-or situation. You cannot have an energy transition to renewables without making fossil fuels more expensive or letting the market make them more expensive, and you cannot keep gas at the pump cheap without environmental consequences caused by its wide use. And here comes the rain. Oh, damn it. Do I start over or do I move inside the rat infested tiny house? We're going to move inside the, we're going to move inside the rat infested Tiny house. All right, we need to make a set change here, guys. Get me and the camera out of the rain. I have to say goodbye. I have to say goodbye to the little dog. All right. So anyway, guys, I could make an entire rant out of this. Uh, I'm going to put the link to this article on here because this goes on and on. An excellent, uh, this is an excellent article. <clears throat> um, okay, let's do a couple more, uh, a couple of more paragraphs then head over to our next story the wall street journals ted nordhaus and morgan d and morgan d brazilian call this a quote welcome hypocrisy in a recent analysis noting it was an inevitability it is also not specific to the u.s people are sensitive to gas alene prices across the world even if, at the same time, many of them are as sensitive to climate change issues, eventually, sensitivity to price t tends to trump environmental 
sensitivity. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> quote, quoting Nordhaus, quote, in the U.S., strong majorities of the public say they support action to address climate change, but that support generally collapses when pollsters place a price tag on that sensitivity. I don't know if I'm just, your future's looking at my shirt or what. Anyway, guys, again, I'm going to put the link to this article, and then when you go over to this article, you can just click on oilprice.com <clears throat> and find the rest of these I'm going to touch on. So in no particular order, uh, let's just go down the list here. How about the U.S. power grid is at risk of catastrophic failure? Prolonged blackouts in Louisiana following Hurricane Ida are a reminder the power grid needs to become more resilient as well as more reliable if even more services such as electric vehicles are going to depend on the grid in the future. The electricity system is already directly responsible for providing a wide range of energy services in homes, offices, and factories. The grid also at the the grid is also at the heart of a collection of other critical systems, including oil and gas supply, water and sewage, transport, communications, public safety, health care, which cannot properly function without it. In the future, the grid is likely to be responsible for the provision of even more energy, energy services as policymakers push to electrify many remaining services as part of the strategy for achieving net zero emissions. But in the rush to electrify the entire energy system, policymakers may be inadvertently increasing the vulnerability of the economy and society in the event of a large area long duration power failure. <clears throat> Rather than several closely connected but separate systems for electricity, gas, oil, and transport, in the future there will increasingly be only one very tightly integrated system increasing the grid's vulnerability to catastrophic failure. Uh, anyway, again, uh, this article uh, At present, blackouts render some services unavailable, such as lighting and power, but households and businesses may be able to use others, such as gas heating and gasoline vehicles. In the future, blackouts could disrupt substantially all energy services. And it goes on from there. Okay. Uh, what is going on with hydropower? At least in, uh, well, they center on Brazil. Uh, but this is true wherever you have hydropower and droughts, uh, such as. Can you say the U.S. West? Extreme weather events are hurting hydropower. So this is, let's just take one example of this. When Brazil's Mines and Energy Minister appeared on TV earlier this week to plead with citizens to reduce their energy consumption due to a drought-induced hydropower crisis, he was not alone. 
Brazil is just one of many energy producing countries facing drought and other extreme weather conditions that are making hydropower production that much harder. <clears throat> In his appearance, Benito Albuquerque warned that Brazil is heading into a worse energy crisis than initially anticipated due to yet another record drought, as well as hindering agricultural and industrial activity. It is badly affecting energy production with hydropower plants reaching their lowest level in 91 years. Experts warn that the drought could continue into 2022, meaning a long-term solution is needed to tackle the crisis. In response to the growing crisis, the federal government is expected to call for electricity cuts of 20% around the country. The, the ministry will also increase energy prices in response to the drought, with consumers paying almost 7% more for electricity from September. Um, this is not an uncommon measure in Brazil following periods of drought due to the country's reliance on power as Brazil's main source of energy, hydropower, provides around three quarters of domestic electricity needs. Uh, Brazil's annual rainfall has been decreasing over the last decade. So uh, if, if the droughts don't get you, the hurricanes will, and uh, <clears throat> take a wild guess how the United States is reacting to all of uh, the shutdowns in the Gulf oil, uh, the offshore oil, you know, while it's offline. What do you think the U.S. is doing? U.S. imports of Russian oil, of Russian oil expected to soar after Hurricane Ida. The United States is set to import more Russian oil this month and next, sources familiar with the matter told Bloomberg, as American supply of medium sour crudes is tight with 77% of U.S. Gulf of Mexico oil production still offline 10 days after Hurricane Ida. Uh, there is increased interest from refiners for Russian oil. Yes. Uh, Bureau uh, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement data on Wednesday, yesterday, showed that 1.4 million barrels per day, or 77% of U.S. Gulf of Mexico production, is still offline. Uh, the U.S. was already importing record volumes of crude oil and petroleum products from R Russia in June of this year, according to the latest available data from the EIA. June imports, before we had a hurricane, of Russian crude and oil pro products hit a record 848,000 barrels per day. Uh, there you go. And that was before the hurricane. Uh, okay. Well, this is technically a story about China, but it has a lot to say about Russia and the U.S. too. Uh, I take this one with a little grain of salt about how China is preparing for life after fossil fuels. 
the green energy re revolution is redrawing the lines of the global geopolitical map and China is fighting to come out on top, while other energy superpowers such as the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Russia have clung to their prodigious oil and gas industries, China has gone all in on establishing their own energy security and independence, uh, a large portion of which will soon be sourced from clean energy resources. Well, I'm going to get back to uh, what their definition of all in and soon means according to oilprice.com. What's going on in the rest of the world? Uh, Europe has largely pivoted away from oil and gas in the last few years, recasting its big oil companies as big energy companies. On the other side of the Atlantic, Big oil's most profitable business is no longer oil itself as the companies derive more and more of their profits from trading rather than extraction. In the United States, oil in the United States on this side of the pond, oil super majors have taken a far different approach than Europe to the impending existential threat of climate change and the clean energy transition, according to an article in the New York Times, quote, while BP and other European companies invest billions in renewable energy, Exxon and Chevron are committed to fossil fuels and betting on moonshots, close quote. Now, of course, uh, maybe somewhere in that New York Times article, they pointed out that while BP uh, and other European countries are investing billions into, quote, renewable energies, they are in still investing billions more in more fossil fuel exploration. Uh, not The U.S. isn't alone. Russia has taken an even harder line when it comes to petro loyalty, as we just saw in that last article, selling its oil to the U.S. President Vladimir Putin has been a staunch climate change denier, <clears throat> and the very idea of pivoting away from oil and gas has been anathema to his administration. Someone will sell the world's last barrel of oil as the age of fossil fuel comes to an end, and Russia intends to be the one. This is a risky business, as Russia's economy is dangerously reliant on fossil fuels, a market with a limited shelf life. Kind of weird story to be playing in oil to a newsletter for oil investors. As it stands, oil and gas now make up more than 60 percent of Russia's total ex exports and adds up to more than 30 percent of Russia's gross domestic product. Uh, indeed, petro nations and oil autocracies around the world risk descending into economic chaos and conflict as oil markets offer diminishing returns. Uh, countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia have become increasingly reliant on Asian markets to buy up their wares. This could prove to be their downfall, while China is still currently the world's biggest oil and coal importer. President Xi Jinping is getting serious about a homegrown clean energy revolution in the interest of shoring up Beijing's geopolitical power, according to Bloomberg, quote, by 2060, in 40 years, 
the world's second largest economy, which will be the world's largest economy, aims to transform its power generation mix from today's roughly 70 from roughly 70 percent from fossil fuels today to 90 percent from renewable sources such as wind and solar as well as hydro and nuclear power. Uh, and while the prognosis is grim for countries that have hedged their bets on Chinese demand for fossil fuels, countries that relied on resource-backed loans from Beijing are in even bigger trouble. One such country, Angola, has already delayed their payments and that is before considering the impact of shifting energy financing priorities, Bloomberg reports. Uh, anyway, uh, we have got uh, to move on. Good Lord, we're going to do one more. Let's go over to electric vehicles where uh, we have this one. The major problem with electric vehicles no one is talking about. Yes. When GM earlier this year started recalling bolts, it issued a warning to owners of the EV, don't charge your battery to 100%. Normally, this would be easy enough to do, but what if your charger got hacked? And uh, anyway, this is a long, complicated story. Uh, what they're talking about is, uh, is hackers uh, taking over all of the... Uh, these EV charging units that you see. They're not talking so much about, you know, doing this in your own private garage. What they're talking about is you see, you're going to see more and more of these public EV charging stations. And uh, this is what hackers are already figuring out. So, uh, Uh, some of the vulnerabilities are no small potatoes. Uh, among the findings of this one study was a vulnerability that could potentially make <clears throat> possible the hacking of millions of electric vehicle chargers simultaneously and another that exposed user and charger data for the hackers to use. Perhaps the most dangerous vulnerability that cybersecurity experts uncovered, however, was the possibility for a hacker to take control over millions of chargers. Uh, quoting the report, as one could potentially switch all the chargers on and off synchronously there's a word synchronously you know at the same time why don't they say at the same time as one could potentially switch all chargers on and off at the same time there is potential to cause stability problems for the power grid owing to the large swings in power demand as reserve capacity struggles to maintain grid frequency. Uh, yep. Uh, there is little talk about the cyber security implications of having a huge network of hundreds of chargers that can be hacked. Uh, public chargers are the riskiest. If they hack a public charger, hackers could gain access to the entire 
network. Gaining access to data is one risk associated with the vulnerabilities of EV chargers also. Another is even more straightforward, electricity theft. If a hacker breaches a public charger, they can siphon electricity off it and make someone else pay. Uh, attacks on home chargers can also be serious, and that's uh, that's not even the worst that can happen. Quote, threat actors also can also gain control of the electric vehicles themselves, which includes control over the steering, brakes, acceleration, and other functions which could result in an accident they would have the ability to listen in on your phone conversations held within the car and steal personal data from the vehicle's connected network too. Everything is hackable. Cybersecurity experts have warned repeatedly from a corporate computer system to a pacemaker and cyber criminals are often ahead of their opponents in the game of cat and mouse, forcing governments and cybersecurity service providers to often catch up. Yes, there you go. Uh, all the myriad ways you never thought of that we are doomed as uh, this whole hacking thing, this cyber security, I don't talk that. I haven't had enough uh, videos on that. We gotta do a video about the uh, the unbelievable rise in this hacking coming our way. But that will be another rant for another day. This will wrap up. Uh, this week's edition of my oilprice.com roundup. <clears throat> so when, tomorrow, yes, tomorrow is Friday. So we will be back to mongabay.com for our ecological meltdown roundup rant. And I got to wrap this up because uh, I have to go to war with a rat in my tiny house. I suggest you get out there and do go to war with rats while you still can because the rats are winning the war. Are you getting a rat or what, little dog? Looks like the sun has come back out. Right. Are you getting the rat or not? Bye, guys.